On a December morning in 1995, two Essex farmers stumbled upon the aftermath of the most infamous gangland hit since the craze. Inside a blue Range Rover were the blood-soaked bodies of violent drug dealers Tony Tucker, Pat Tate and Craig Rolfe. All three had been blasted in the head with a pump-action shotgun. In 1998, Jack Wombs and Michael Steele were sentenced to life for what became known as the Essex Boys' murders. Both have always insisted they're innocent. And now, as Wombs is finally released from prison, their claims are backed by two former senior detectives. This ain't wrong with the investigation. No fingerprints, no DNA. The whole thing just stinks to high heaven. This was retribution, this was punishment, a professional, proper hit. There's been a, a huge miscarriage of justice. I stopped the M25, I went onto the gantry, put banners up. Um, eight and a half hours I was up there. I took a, um, a wardrobe, a complete wardrobe with skeletons in it to the CPS offices. And I'd done one outside the home office. I took a body there on a trolley, hospital trolley. Unbelievable amount of stunts that I'd done. But I kept it, high profile. Kept it and I wasn't even gonna give up. John Wombs has spent over two decades campaigning for his brother's freedom. Now, after 23 years behind bars, Jack has finally been released on parole. But there's no champagne to mark the occasion. I don't think it's anything to celebrate. You know, we've still got the justice to fight. He's home, but he's still got to fight that. We've got to clear the name, and which we will. We'll clear the name. Growing up in rural Suffolk, the brothers shared a passion for cars, but their tinkering with motors wasn't always legal. In 1992, it saw them both jailed for 16 months for car ringing. Behind bars, they met Michael Steele, Essex boy Pat Tate, and a man who'd one day turned supergrass, Darren Nichols. Fast forward to May 1996, and former BT engineer Nichols was arrested after 10 kilograms of cannabis were found in his transit van. When he was accused by cops of being a member of the gang that murdered the Essex boys, he started to talk. He told of a feud between Wombs, Steele and the three dealers over a shoddy shipment of cannabis that ended in the execution-style hit in Retterdon, Essex, with Nichols, the unwitting getaway driver. His account was corroborated by mobile phone data placing Wombs near the scene of the crime. Both men offered alternative explanations for being in the area. In January 1998, Steele and Wombs were convicted of the murders and sentenced to life. Nichols pleaded guilty to drugs running and was given a lenient sentence, gifted a new identity and rehoused at a secret location. In 2006, Wombs and Steele were granted an appeal, but judges ruled the convictions should stand. Now, the officer who busted Nichols for the cannabis haul has decided to re-examine the Rettenden case. I'm, uh... David McKelvey, uh, I was a former detective. Uh, I worked in the Metropolitan Police and on the regional and national crime squads. I'd spent most of my career investigating serious and organised crime. And at the time of uh, the Retina murders in 1995, I was a detective constable on the South East Regional Crime Squad based at Brentwood Branch Office. The 90s, the early 90s, were the beginning of really the cocaine trade. Experts say it's become cheaper to buy and fashionable to try. You had gangs vying for position. A tonne of high quality South American cocaine was seized with a street value of £160 million. The murder rate, for instance, was double what it is now because as the gangs were vying for position, they were assassinating other competitors as such. You also had the ecstasy scene take off at about the same time, um, the rave scene take off. So you had unlicensed events all over, the, uh, all over the countryside, including Essex. Once there, many of them will shell out for an ecstasy tablet or capsule. Clubs were openly supplying and selling ecstasy, and it was a new thing, and organised crime had just literally moved in, and they sold that as a commodity. This factory has produced 200,000 tablets in the last 48 hours. There was competition to, uh, to put in place structured organised criminal gangs because of the amount of money that 
was involved. This is believed to be the biggest police haul of the drug ecstasy in Britain this year, and it has a market value of £10 million. And it's the formation, really, of organised crime on the scale it is now. Heads of crime, all the captains and all of their lieutenants below them. Um, and that was, that was building up throughout the 90s. In the hinterland, where East London's sprawl gives way to the marshlands of Essex, three men were making a name for themselves in the 1990s criminal underworld. The firm, as they were known to some, consisted of violent cocaine addict Craig Rolfe, ex-soldier Tony Tucker, the bodybuilding head of a security firm that sold drugs and specialised in punishment beatings, and Tucker's enforcer, Pat Tate, a drug-dependent man mounted with a temper to match his impressive physique. He filled a doorway. When he came through the doorway, he filled it. He was a 20-stone steroid-up monster, you know? Very short fused, Pat. Very, very short fused. There was an incident in High Point, um, which was horrific. A couple of the guys had beaten this young lad to bits who had been stealing out of cells. And um, he was, like, bleeding at the top of the stairs. And Pat said, no, that's, that ain't the way you deal with him. And then Pat picked up a sauce bottle, which we had in our room, you know, a red sauce bottle, tomato sauce, strange enough, and smashed it on the side and stuck it in his face and turned it. Blood everywhere. And then Pat drops the bottle, picks him up, walks to the landing, drops him over the landing, hits the alarm bell, all the screws come, as if it was plain as day. That was Pat. Tucker, Tate and Rolf controlled the flow of drugs through Essex nightclubs. But despite the trio's posthumous infamy, they were far from Mr. Biggs. You know, they'd been portrayed in all the films as major, major gang leaders and gangsters. They weren't. They weren't by any shadow of the imagination. They were not major criminals. Um, they were localised drug dealers who had a propensity for violence. McKelvey has since retired from the Metropolitan Police and now runs a private detective firm, TMI. Four years ago, his interest in the Rettenden murders was reignited after a phone call from Jack Worms' defence team. As a result of that conversation, I kept in touch and material was shown to me over a period of time and reading that material, um, I had grave doubts uh, about what had gone on. We looked at it in more detail and you could see there was this smell around the whole job. I brought in some of the UK's top retired detectives, homicide detectives, and we began a review uh, back in February last year of the whole case. McKelvey enlisted the help of retired Chief Superintendent Albert Patrick, a specialist in homicide case reviews. Patrick returned with us to the Rettenden crime scene to examine the prosecution's version of events. This will take some time because I've spent six months on it. Here we go. Five o'clock in the morning, Mr Nichols gets up from his house in Braintree and drives off across the M11, down the M11, round M25 to Heathrow, up the M3 to his place of work. Darren Nichols has done his day's work, rings, steel. They agree to meet five o'clock at Mark's Tay. That's the evidence that the jury have. He goes there, Mr. Steele turns up in his Hilux. Minutes later, Jack Williams turns up in the Passat. At 6.30, 18.30, the Range Rover turns up with all three on board. Uh, and that's the meet at half past six. So 18.30, 6.30 is when the suspects and the victims are together. The split then, we've got uh, Mr. Nichols in the Passat driving, Mr. Wilms passenger, and they drive to the top of the lane here, Workhouse Lane, and he gets dropped off. He picks up a bag from the vehicle and he walks down here, according to Nichols' account, and waits in the bushes just behind me. The Range Rover and the Hilux leave the halfway house and they go to a pub car park called the Hungry Horse about five, ten minutes over the hill. And uh, Mr. Steele gets out of the Hilux and into the back seat of the Range Rover to join Mr. Tate. They drive down here and they stop. Uh, Mr. Steele is going to open the fire bar gate. This road is still open. Uh, Jack Williams comes out the bushes and shoots all three. <laughs> So that's three shots, he shoots him again, which is six. He either goes round the front or round the back, stands here and he fires twice through the closed window, the glass, and the glass is actually embedded 
into the body of Mr. Tate. Without a shadow of a doubt, this was retribution, this was punishment, this was a professional hit. How come there's no fingerprints, there's no DNA, all the sort of things you'd be looking at, yeah, have never been uncovered from this vehicle. So, very, very good at what the guy's doing, and I think he's done it before. Because that was a professional, proper hit. Meant to kill them, killed them in the parts of the body that give an indication that you're out of order, mate. Somebody said once, who would want to kill him? Another person said, well, ask anyone who met him. Steve Nipper Ellis is a former gangster and one-time associate of the Essex Boys. He met Patrick Tate in prison in Chelmsford in 1990. On their release, the pair began a mutually beneficial friendship. They had an empire of crime. Credit cards, dodgy money, um, selling drugs, robbing drug dealers, um, all the good stuff. Nipper once counted the trio as friends, but his memories of them now are far from fond. Tony was a bully, Tony was a piece of shit. Uh, Craig was his little gopher, his little Joey mug. And Pat, when they started doing coke together, injecting it, they were like birds of a feather. They went downhill together. They, they had begun to take their own drugs, um, and that had in turn, from the people we've spoken to, they, they changed character, particularly Pat Tate had changed his character quite dramatically and was becoming quite violent. Ellis's relationship with the Essex boys soured after he made a crude sexual remark about Tony Tucker's girlfriend. Tucker responded by coming to Nipper's home, sticking a gun to his head and threatening to cut off his limbs with a meat cleaver. And he, he just looked at me and he went, your hand or your foot? So I was thinking, if you cut off my foot, I can't chase you. I'm left-handed, so I held out my right arm and I thought, I shut my eyes, I thought, I'm going to cry, I'm going to scream, it's going to hurt, but I'm going to kill you. True to his word, Ellis set about hunting down the trio. By then, the word had gone out. Two people had gone to my dad and phoned, one phoned me saying, oh, they're going to get your sister, they're going to kidnap one of your sisters and cut the fingers off. So I, I just basically it was a mess. One night, he arrived at Pat Tate's house armed with a handgun. All I knew was I had to empty the gun into him, just bang, 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 that's all I had to do. Nipper squeezed the trigger, striking Tate once in the elbow. He screamed, <laughs> which as a friend of mine said, wouldn't you with a big lump of red hot lead in your arm? So. Ellis received a 15 month prison sentence for possession of a firearm following the shooting. Tate lived until December 1995, when Ellis says his late father, Sid, finished the job. Next morning, phones rang, it's my dad. He just kept saying, they're dead, they're dead. And I was just worried what he'd done. And he said, don't worry. He said, I'm okay, no one knows. Uh, how I felt, best thing in the world. McKelvey has interviewed Ellis and says he's found no evidence to corroborate his claim his father killed the Essex boys. After a painstaking investigation, McKelvey points to another alleged version of events told to cops by a man called Billy. He is a, is a mid-tier criminal, uh, linked in, associated with Canning Town criminals, East London villains, and he gets arrested uh, on the 14th of January, 96. So just over uh, a month after the murders. And he gets taken to Forest Gate Police Station and immediately on arrival at the police station, he asks to see the CID and tells his story and version of what he says happened at Retterton. Very detailed. Billy had been arrested in connection with an armed robbery. He would later appear as a witness at Worms and Steel's 1997 trial. He says categorically, I drove the man who did kill Tucker Tate and Rolf to Rettendon, uh, and that man is the man who was responsible for murdering them. He says that he picked up a stolen car on false plates from Canning Town, and that he drove that car and picked up the assassin. He was then directed by that person to a minicab office in Upminster. He collected a 14-shot uh, Browning pistol. He already had a bag that had a pump-action shotgun in it. And then from there, uh, they then drove under the direction of this assassin to this area. Where this becomes interesting is that he doesn't say that he got to the Rettendon Turnpike, the roundabout, 
and then took the third exit, which is down towards Rettendon. He says he took the fourth exit. Now this is a man who's never been to this area before, doesn't know it at all. He takes the fourth exit, which is a road that takes you off over in that direction, completely away from this area. However, as you drive down that road, on the left-hand side, about a mile, mile and a half down, there's a, a dirt track. And as he got down the dirt track, the assassin got out of the car, carrying the pump action shotgun in the bag, and walked across the fields. Now, the, the, the point of that is he doesn't know the area, and yet he manages to describe this, and the route is, as you can see, not that far. So he's managed to, to, to understand a route in that, that nobody else had, had, had thought of before. Billy claimed the Retterdon murders were carried out during a cocaine deal, and not at 1859, as Nichols claimed, but around midnight. He told police the hit was ordered by a South London criminal and organised by an East London firm, and that he was the unwitting getaway driver. The assassin got out of the car, carrying the pump-action shotgun in the bag, and walked across the fields. Now, if you look over there, that's, that's effectively, just beyond there, is the lane. The assassin walks from there, comes down through here, comes to the Range Rover, uh, where they would have been uh, waiting for him, takes the, the four kilos of cocaine in the rucksack, shoots the three of them dead, uh, and then makes his way back over that way. And obviously, the importance of that is that that's where the five mile gate is here. Forensically, nothing has ever been done at the time around that, that area there. All the forensic material or forensics examination is done this side. So um, there's been a huge loss of forensic material there. Um, and that's, that's obviously a huge problem. Billy testified at Worms and Steele's trial that he'd made his confession hoping to get an easy time from the law for another offence. But he told the jury he was instead prosecuted and sent to prison. During the trial, he refused to name the gangsters he'd accused of the murders, admitting he was frightened. McKelvey is now appealing for anyone with information on the case to come forward. The most important thing for us is that we identify anybody that's prepared to come forward and talk to us that will prove that Tucker, Tate and Rolf were still alive after 1859. That's the time categorically that the Crown say that Tucker, Tate and Rolf were assassinated and dead by 1859. We don't believe that's correct and we'd invite anybody who has information that could assist us to come forward. The Criminal Cases Review Commission say Worms and Steele's convictions have been under active review for potential miscarriages of justice since May 2018. They said no decision has yet been taken on whether or not the case will be referred once more to the Court of Appeal. Meanwhile, the Worms brothers plan to continue their fight to clear Jack's name. I'm 100% confident. Jack will clear his name. 100%. Thank you.